started. Thank you for coming. Uh, good to see some of you again, and nice to meet those I didn't see this morning. Uh, who was at the session this morning? Because the first bit's a bit repeated. Okay, well, we'll do that bit but quickly. Uh, my name is Owen Woods. Uh, I'm the CTO of a company called Indalva, who do software engineering for other people. Um, and uh, one of the things we do is we build blockchain applications, at the moment mainly proof of concepts, because that's mainly what people are doing. Um, and one of the blockchains we use is Ethereum. Um, I gave a talk this morning putting blockchain sort of in the, in the overall technical position in the ecosystem, uh, and that's quite conceptual. This afternoon's exactly the opposite. It's not conceptual at all. There's code on the screen and everything. Um, the reason I did this session really was, it, um, who came to Connor's session earlier? Connor Svensson? A few of you? So um, really, we did suggest it. Maybe they should have been switched. His is sort of a deep dive around the Web3J library. Um, mine is... All the stuff I wish I'd known 18 months ago when I started trying to develop an Ethereum application because it was utterly bewildering. It really felt like I was banging my head off a brick wall until I met people like Connor and people in the Ethereum meetup and people at Indava. We kind of worked together and we cracked stuff and then we found an all-important Stack Overflow post that saved us three weeks. And this is the presentation I wish I'd been to when I started that process. So hopefully it will be interesting. Um, Quickly what blockchains are all about, and then what is Ethereum? Oh, I should just level set. Who here uses Ethereum already? So if, if I said, what, is an, what does an Ethereum block contain? How many people would know that answer already? Nobody. Perfect. In which case, I'll explain that, as opposed to telling you all what you already know. Um, and then talk a bit about application design, because when you go and look at all the web pages, they just tell you how to develop the Ethereum bit. And it's after a while it dawns on you you can't do all that much in Ethereum. What you can do is sort of magical, but you can only do, solve a bit of the problem. It's a bit like if you go and read the, the MongoDB site, and they really tell you how to develop the database bit. How about all the rest of the app? And that's never talked about, so I'll, I'll, it's, it's simple, but it's important to understand, so I'll briefly talk about that. And then I'll talk about what the development process is like. I've got a section really for a longer talk on Solidity, the language you use. It's got a sort of long example. I'll show you snippets of Solidity through the rest of it, but I'm confident we do not have time to do that section. But you'll get the slides afterwards, so you can just have a look through it. It's a real smart contract in the sense that it's not one of the training examples from the standard GitHub repo that everyone uses. I wrote it. We use it in Dava repeatedly as a base to do other things with. It's, it, it's our hello world, but it's actually a contract. It's actually a token contract. It's not just like the greeter. Um, and then, of course, we'll summarize. We always do. So, what is a blockchain? Uh, it's the thing that underpins Bitcoin and Ethereum. We know that. Those are cryptocurrencies. And it's a, it's a, it's a distributed database with the one really defining quality, no one entity's in control. And that means it's, um, it, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. It's also highly auditable because it's append-only protected by cryptography. So you can be sure that when people put entries into the blockchain, if you go and find those entries later on, they haven't been tampered with. They're the same. You can also prove, mathematically if you want to, that the, the blocks that have been written into the blockchain have not changed. That is, their content has not changed and the ordering of them has not changed. And that actually to prove with most databases is quite hard. You normally get down to some risk argument around access control. It actually, Ethereum is based on cryptography. Um, and this means that you can, you can use it to collaborate with people who accept the rules of the game, but you don't trust other than that. And that's pretty interesting if you've got a number of commercial organizations want to share distributed state. Because today, it's not really obvious how they do that. Today, actually, in capital markets, what they do is they send each other millions of rows of CSV files every night and hope for the best. And you know, it normally doesn't end well. That's why reconciliation solutions cost millions of dollars. My interest in it is not really the cryptocurrency stuff. It's, is it a useful piece of a real system? Because I'm really a solution architect by background and training. So if you were an architect, what would you need to know to think about selecting a blockchain or not for your system? Firstly, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. That could be a marvelous thing or a quite annoying thing. So that's quite an important point. And it's append-only. We mentioned that. But if you need something other than append-only, it's a terrible choice. It uses cryptographic security, which is almost certainly a good thing, but it does introduce some complexities, as any of you who've worked with cryptography will know. And it's eventually consistent, with a stress on the eventual bit. 
Whereas most distributed systems, when they talk about eventual consistency, mean, oh, you know, a couple of seconds. And developers look at them with horror as to how they're going to cope. Ethereum, it's a couple of minutes, or maybe quite a few minutes, on the main net. In fact, on private networks, it's a lot faster than that. But it's still, compared to almost any database technology, it's a long time to achieve consistency. And that's because it uses a distributed consensus protocol based on work. They contain smart contracts. Think of those as stored procedures for the blockchain. You can embed code into the blockchain, and the blockchain is immutable. So therefore, once it's written, you know nobody's changed the code. All the developers here should immediately be thinking, oh, that doesn't sound like a good thing. And you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? Um, and it's got a very, very high degree of fault tolerance. If you've got hundreds of nodes in your system, you can, you can lose 100 nodes and no one's going to notice. You literally will not know that those nodes have gone unless you're monitoring some quite detailed statistics about the network. None of the people sending transactions in will have any clue those nodes went. Um, it's computationally expensive because it is peer-to-peer -peer and everyone is checking everybody else's homework. All the work's done on every node, which when you think about it, if you're going to have a trusted peer-to-peer -peer system, that's the way it's going to have to work. But actually, people often don't think about that when they start out. They're, I think there's an assumption that all the work's done on one node and the others sort of check it. It's not all the work's kind of tends to be end up being done everywhere. It's also, people describe it as a database. I describe it as a database. It's got a very limited query model. You can only retrieve things by their primary key. Basically, you've got transactions, blocks, addresses, not very much more than that. You can retrieve that stuff by primary key. You cannot run a query across it, mainly because of the vast scale of the thing. It, makes, it doesn't actually make all that much sense. Um, public blockchains have got a lack of privacy. This, to some of my clients, is utterly, utterly unexpected, which I never quite understand why. There's a hint in the name, public. But when you write all your data to a public blockchain, it's all available to everyone. Anyone with access to that blockchain can read all of it. There are, I know... If any of you are thinking zero knowledge proofs, you're quite right. There are things emerging to change that, but right now, it's all public. And they tend to have rather low throughput. Tens of transactions per second for normal public blockchains is about where we are today. And if you're using those that same technology um, to create a private blockchain, you're, that's the throughput you're going to get. There are blockchains that are much faster, um, but standard public blockchain technology, that's where we're at today. And there are many projects trying to solve it. <coughs> So if you wanted to actually use it in an application, how would you select a good application? The key thing is it should be multi-organizational. If you basically want a distributed database for your company, then go and use a distributed database. There are quite a few to choose from. Don't use a blockchain. Um, if you've got multiple organizations, though, using a single distributed database across them is really hard to pull off. Who's in control? How does administration work? Is there a master? Who's the master? Who's the slave? All that, all that stuff. Even if you've got multi-masters and they migrate around across organizational boundaries, that's really difficult. Um, situations where you don't have a trusted intermediary. If you've got people cooperating and there's someone in the middle, low cost, reliable, trustworthy, and everyone's happy, you probably don't need a blockchain. Um, if, on the other hand, the people would like to communicate directly, or they've got an intermediary they don't like, which is the case in, with many banks, got lots of intermediaries they don't like, then actually blockchain looks very promising. Um, it's got to be a problem with shared state. There aren't too many problems that don't have shared state, but it, it is a data storage problem fundamentally. And then if you need immutability, you know, a proof of um, like, like non-repudiation, non proving it's tamper resistant, those kind of things point towards a blockchain. Should be transactional type interactions. If you're moving huge blocks of data around, and that's fundamentally what your system does, not really. Blockchain's not really for you. There are approaches to doing that, which we're not going to talk about today. If you're interested, go and Google Swarm and IPFS. But um, blockchains themselves are not good with large amounts of data. They're intended for these small pieces, fixed record kind of things, small data sizes. Again, if you've got a complex query requirement, you're going to have to think how to solve that. It's a little harsh to say you can't use a blockchain, but you're going to have to do something other than just use the blockchain. Um, if you've got multiple people need to write to it and you don't want to be able, you don't want to have to trust them all very deeply, that's another good indicator you might have a blockchain. And if you're not too worried about latency, 
Occasionally, you'll come across people who say, I'm going to revolutionize you know, for foreign exchange pre-trade pricing. And you go, no, you're not. Not with a blockchain. Because it's going to take seconds to get to consensus, best case, with a private one. And you need you know, millisecond or sub-millisecond. So they're just a bad match. On the other hand, if you go to the insurance industry and you say, well, it, 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 it's quite slow. It gains consistency in minutes. They look at you and go, that's fantastic. Currently, we normally get consistency in days because they send documents to each other. So it's all about what your expectations are. Because um, of the throughput thing, if you've got something that needs a million transactions a minute, it's probably not going to be a blockchain. Um, and finally, if you need high resiliency in your data store, there are many ways of achieving resiliency. But as we mentioned, the peer-to-peer -peer nature of blockchain does make it highly resilient, which is useful. My favorite quote on this is, is a guy called Gideon Greenspan. He's the CEO or CTO of Multichain, who are a British startup doing an enterprise blockchain. Um, Multichain's very interesting. He's a very strong-minded person who writes very well-written blog posts. I strongly recommend them. His quote I love, it's that, if your requirements are fulfilled by today's relational databases, you'd be insane to use a blockchain. He doesn't mince his words, but that's absolutely the sentiment that I have come to over the last 18 months or so. Blockchains are unique and they solve problems we cannot solve other ways, but they're not plug-in replacements for generalized databases. Quickly, the sort of things blockchains are being used for. People are trying to use them to store documentation to do with um, tr um, shipping life cycles. They're trying to use them for supply chains. They're trying to use them to share data between financial organizations. They're trying to use them to create identities, which are verifiable, and then people can you know, add it, evidence to, the, to, to their identity, so it can be checked in a single place. People are trying to store government records on them, and people are trying to use them to, um, to um, create, not exactly tamper-resistant data, but to prove that data was in a particular state at a particular point in time, what's known as a distributed notary. So those are the kind of things. You can see immediately all of those decentralized, lots of organizations involved, not low latency, or, or quite high latency, relatively speaking, but all things where distributed trust is quite a big problem, and they're all about sharing state. And that's what leads you to a blockchain. I'm just going to skip over this. I've realized this slide is probably at this point not very interesting, so we're just going to keep moving. And there are quite, one thing to just bear in mind, there are quite a lot of blockchains, if, um, and they are a lifestyle choice. You don't port from one blockchain to another. You redesign your application from scratch, throw all the code away and start again. They're not interoperable, with a few, very few specific exceptions that have got very, very close lineage. Um, if you write an Ethereum application, it's got, it, it just is completely irrelevant in Corda, the R3 distributed ledger. They just work in different ways. Um, very briefly, Ethereum is the one we'll talk about today. Bitcoin, you've all heard of. Neo is a new... Um, open source project from China for building enterprise blockchains. Multichain is a British startup who are creating a blockchain. Interestingly, they don't really have smart contracts. Go and read Gideon's blog about why that's a good idea. Um, Hyperledger is um, the Linux Foundation's open source um, blockchain, backed very heavily by IBM, but there's a lot of other companies involved too, including actually in, in Dava, are, are part of the technical mailing list. Um, and Corda is the... Um, a distributed ledger strictly rather than blockchain from the R3 consortium, which is a consortium of hundreds of financial institutions who wish to use distributed ledger technology in their industry, particularly in post-trade processing. There are many other blockchains too. That's just six I thought were quite representative. So what is Ethereum? It's an open source product, project. Uh, it, it is a blockchain. It's cryptographically distri um, protected distributed ledger. It's been around a few years. It came out, it originated because uh, Vitalik Buterin, Gavin Wood, and Joseph Lubin had all worked on Bitcoin. And Vitalik Buterin in particular, who's, in, well, they're all incredibly clever, but he's an incredibly clever mathematician, distributed systems person. He had worked on um, Bitcoin, and I kind of went, no, this isn't what I was thinking of when I started this. This is too limited, and there were some decisions we made for good reasons I now realize are too constraining to move forwards with. So he rethought it, and Gav Wood, who's British as it happens, um, he wrote a very, very clear specification, the Ethereum yellow paper, which I'll show you later. Um, and it took off from there. And there is now a Swiss foundation, the Ethereum Foundation, that um, owns the conceptual intellectual property for it. And their point is not to create a cryptocurrency platform, believe it or not. It's used a lot for ICOs, but that isn't why they're creating it. They want to create a distributed application platform 
which is why from the beginning, one of Buterin's points was, it's got to have a rich and powerful programming language, not a very, very limited, painful language like Bitcoin. And so they just started going in different directions from the very beginning. It's got a very vibrant ecosystem. I'm not gonna go through all the icons, but the point is there are quite a lot of icons. Interesting thing is, if I'd done this slide 18 months ago, at least half those icons either wouldn't have been worth putting on the slide or wouldn't have existed. There's a lot going on, it's changing very quickly. So the key concepts you've got to grasp behind Ethereum are what is a block and what's in a block? What's consensus? What a smart contract is? There's a concept called an event, which is very, very useful, so it's worth knowing about it. And then what's a transaction? This is a call, because all programmers need to know that because you have to decide which one you're gonna use. And then these mysterious things that you see a lot of Stack Overflow questions on, on Ether, gas, gas cost and fees. One of the things I didn't mention earlier was anything you do to a blockchain needs to be paid for. Now on a public blockchain, on the public mainnet, you pay an Ether, which is worth real fiat currency, which is why actually when we're working at Indava, we don't tend to use it because it's, it's non-trivial amounts of money if you do a lot on it. So there are a number of test networks. You still need to pay. It's just the huge upside is, is that they'll give you the money for free. So they will transfer you Ether on their networks for free, and then you can use the network. But actually, until you have that Ether, you cannot do anything on the network. And this is the, this concept of gas and gas cost, which I'll explain in a moment. So this is what Ethereum looks like. Ethereum is a peer-to-peer -peer system, so you have a lot of nodes. I've exploded one node out so you can see its guts. The other nodes have got roughly the same structure inside. And there are different kinds of nodes in the network. There are people who run full nodes, and a full node is simply a node that's got a copy of the entire blockchain in it, which is big. Some people run light nodes, and light nodes are simply f nodes as well, but they've decided not to keep the entire blockchain. They keep some summary information, and they rely on the other nodes to keep the blockchain current and to check things on their behalf. And then you've got some of the people are mining nodes. They are full nodes who also have the right to add stuff to the blockchain. And anyone that can actually decide to be a mining node, you're not elected, you just decide you're gonna do it. But mining is a very computationally expensive process. So it's not something in Ethereum you do casually. You don't just kind of go home and put your MacBook Pro on the internet and go start mining. Well, you can, but nothing will happen. You'll never mine a block. You, you need a lot of, normally these days, custom hardware to mine blocks, because that, that's the whole point. That's, how the trust of the network built. Within a, within a node, you have blocks, which are organized into a complicated set of data structures called Merkle trees, which are cryptographically protected trees, computer science trees. You have smart contracts, uh, and smart contracts have effectively timers on them. This is this idea of gas, we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, smart contracts, whenever they run, their execution is monitored, the amount of it's really the number of instructions they uh, execute is counted, and that all has to be paid for. And at some point, if you don't have enough money, your contract stops. It's just terminated immediately because you've, you've spent all your money. And every Ethereum node exports an, uh, an RPC interface to allow it to communicate with other nodes and other nodes to communicate with it. And actually, what we're going to be looking at today is not in the nodes at all. It's in the client application. If you want to communicate with Ethereum, then you use the JSON RPC protocol, it's JSON over HTTP, to, uh, I think, certainly JSON based, um, um, to communicate with any number of Ethereum nodes. You can communicate with any Ethereum node on the network, it just doesn't matter, because everything's peer-to-peer -peer and replicated. All you're doing is it's your entry point. And actually, most clients will um, potentially open connections to, to more than one. So that's what's in Ethereum, conceptually. The actual blocks, if you've come to one of my talks and I've put up the quite simplistic picture of transactions in a block chained together, it is true the blocks do contain transactions in Ethereum and they are chained together. But all you've got to remember from this slide is they're a bit more complicated than that. Because if I don't mention that, then the whole smart contract thing is just black magic. In fact, what they hold is transactions, which is sticking something in the blockchain, it's transferring Ether around, or it's running something in a smart contract. That's what a transaction requests and records. There's the state. All the smart contracts have state. That's why they work, because they're computer programs, right? 
they transform state from one value to another, and they can have complex state. And so there's a, a state tree, so you've got to keep the state in the blockchain, strictly speaking alongside it, but that's a real detail. And then every time a transaction happens, its outputs are gathered into something called a receipt, so that, so that we're recording what happened, such as those events. Did it have any events? What block did it end up in? All those kind of things. When did it run? All that goes into the receipts. And again, there's a big, complicated, cryptographically protected tree of receipts. You don't need any of the detail. It's just that a block is not just transactions. That's the key thing to take away. Consensus, I'm not really going to talk about, except that if you've got a peer-to-peer -peer system and you've got a lot of concurrent activity on it, you clearly need a way of everyone agreeing what the current state is. I'm just really going to leave it at that and say that problem has been figured out. That process is called mining, and it involves solving a computationally difficult problem. And effectively what happens is all the, all the mining nodes race to solve the problem to get the right to add the next block. The first one to solve the problem adds the next block, and they all go back to square one to start racing to add the next block. Why do they do that? because they get paid ether, which is in the real chain is worth money, they get paid ether to add, to add blocks to the chain. So whoever gets to add the block gets a payment. And if you're a Ethereum person, there is then a more complicated cascade of value to people who are mining at the same time. Okay. Um, that's called a proof of work system, because to put something on the, on the blockchain, you have to prove you've done a lot of work. There is another system called proof of stake, nicknamed Casper, which has been designed and is currently in test. And the Ethereum folks expect that to be rolling out in the medium future, in the next couple of releases. Smart contracts, these are effectively, if you think of it as a database, they're the stored procedures. They're what you call to get the database to do something, to change its state. They're written in one of a number of languages. There are four languages, actually. But the only one we need to care about is called Solidity. And Solidity is compiled to... Ethereum virtual machine bytecode, EVM bytecode, just the same way as Java goes to JVM bytecode. Um, you deploy the code onto the blockchain using one of those magic transactions. That's one of the three transaction types we've got. And then you invoke it with another transaction. When it goes onto the blockchain, it's obviously at a location. That location has an address. And when we want to execute it, we send an RPC to our local node to say, I'd like to execute this method on the thing at this location. That's how execution works. And again, that's why you've got to pay for it, because it's a transaction. And what that transaction will probably do, it'll take the state of the contract right now, say it's got a single value in it, which has got a value of 10, you'll add one to it, it will copy the state, and uh, so the only difference will be the state before it was 10, the state after is 11. We've got two copies of the state. And that's all a smart contract does. It's a very neat mathematical model. It's a state transformer. It's got an initial state, and then any number of following states, which are um, monotonically ordered, um, and the smart contract is simply transforming the state as you go. An odd thing about smart contracts, which I didn't grasp for quite a long time, is that they're totally isolated. They can't make an RPC call out to the internet. They can't access the file system. There's no console.log like in JavaScript no system.out.println. And after a while, I was thinking, I'm not quite clear how you connect this to anything. And then I discovered events. Events are actually very, very simple. They are simply log entries. You declare them in your code as to the events that you want your code to be able to raise. And they're just a name and a set of parameters. And then you simply embed invocations of that event into your Solidity code. We, when we're writing Solidity in Java, we embed a lot of events in our Solidity code. In fact, what, the, the little example I show you today doesn't have any, because you have to handle them on the client side, which I didn't want to complicate it with. So we've only got another half hour. But that's how you link Solidity, smart contracts, to the outside world. The Solidity writes events. Those events are written into those transaction receipts. And the client, having invoked, um, they can get a response back if there's a, if there's a response type to the, um, to the method they've called. The other thing they can do is they can say, give me my receipt. And inside that receipt are the events that fired. So you can imagine that can be tremendously useful. Because um, I mean, a, a pattern you could use that with is call a smart contract. I'll fire out an event to tell you something's happened. 
fine, I'll take, I'll take the receipt. I'll have a look at the event. Oh, I'll go and do something in response. Then I'll call you again, having got something from the internet. So for example, that's how you could implement some kind of external reference off the blockchain. So that's why events aren't highlighted all that strongly in the documentation. They're actually pretty important to making many real blockchain applications work. Um, Web3j, which we talked about a bit this morning, it's Connor Svensson's client library for Java. It's, I'm not sure if it's official, but it, it is the client library for Java for Ethereum. Um, it makes, so the top is solidity, and you see where it says event, large thing happened, event, small thing happened. That's the declaration of two events. That's all you do. It's very straightforward. And the bit underneath is a solidity function, and it's pretty simple. It's not really doing anything very interesting, but it will create two different events depending on its parameter value. And then from Java, the details of the Java don't really matter, but the point is the client library, having called my contract.cause event 50, we can then read. Uh, the client library makes it very straightforward to retrieve the events. And we can find out if large thing happened or small thing happened was fired. Obviously, that's a kind of useless example. But as developers, you can immediately see how you can start using that to do quite interesting things. The other thing is it can give you very fine-grained um, information about what happened in the smart contract. Given that there is no way to print anything to a log when it's running in, inside the Ethereum node, that's incredibly handy, especially when you're debugging. When you're early on, I recommend throw events all over your solidity because uh, lots of unexpected paths will, um, uh, will be taken through your code. And one of the ways you find that out is by seeing the events fire. One other detail I'll mention as we're passing, you'll hear people talking about transactions and calls. For quite a long time, I thought that was just two words for the same thing. I had some very confusing debugging sessions. They're completely different. They both invoke something on the blockchain, but they're for totally different purposes. A transaction, as its name suggests, mutates the state of the blockchain. It's, it's transmitted to every node in the network, at least eventually, and you pay for it. It costs gas, that is, an amount of ether, to fire it, because it actually takes work, proper work. That's got side effects. A call does not change the state of the blockchain. A call just goes to the nearest node, it can give you an answer, and it gives you an answer. So you don't need to pay for it. it hasn't mutated anything. Have that one for free. We're sure you'll be back with the transaction in a minute. You can run as many calls as you like. Um, so they are quite different. And in fact, it's, it's how you invoke it. There are different primitives in the RPC protocol for transactions and calls. I just mentioned it in passing, because if you get them confused and you try and change the, change the state of the blockchain with a call, you're just left there scratching your head because it completes completely successfully. Because it's done what you asked. It's run and not changed the state of the blockchain. The fact the solidity looks as if it should change the state of the blockchain makes the whole thing a bit confusing. So to get on to these mystical ether, gas, cost, and fees, briefly, this is not hard. All you've got to do is remember the words. Ether, cryptocurrency. Yeah, that's the, the, that's the currency of your blockchain. And don't get the test ones and the production ones confused. Every blockchain has its own. So Rinkeby is a test net. Rinkeby's ether is worthless. Mainnet's the real thing. Its ether is really rather expensive. So as you're, as, as you're burning through it, you might want to bear that in mind. Gas is an abstract idea. Gas is the amount of effort that the EVM is going to have to expend to execute your smart contract. And it measures it in real time. Every... Uh, so every one of those um, bytecode instructions has got a gas value attached to it. So when it executes an add, I can't remember how many, but say that's 12 gas. So you've got a counter, add two numbers, it'll add 12 to your counter. And it just keeps counting. At the end, what the um, node that you sent that request to will do is it will charge you the number of gas you have burnt. So that's the number of, you know, execution steps, simplistically, times the price of each one. Now, the slightly confusing thing is you choose what you're prepared to pay for the gas. Now, most systems you deal with say, here's the cost, Sonny, pony up the cash. This one goes, what do you fancy paying? Which is a bit confusing. If you set it too high, especially on mainnet, 
which I've done a few times, it can be very, very expensive because they go, they don't go, that's a maximum. They go, yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. I will execute your transaction right now and I will charge you, whatever it is, 40 gigawe for every single piece of gas. And I go, I've just spent $12.80 executing the greeter contract. How on earth did that happen? That did happen to me. And then you go and read, reread the Solidity Manual again. You go, oh, I think I get it this time. Um, there's nothing like losing some money to really focus the mind. Um, if you set it too low, it sits there and all the miners just look at it and go, it's not really worth the effort. There's all this other stuff is paying much higher fees. I'm going to put their transactions in next. So it's actually a bit confusing when you first meet it. You set the price, but according to how high a price you've got, that will affect when you get next mined into a block. There are some ways around it. There's a site called ETH Gas Station we'll look at if we get time, um, where you can find out what the current costs on the network are. And so fee is the gas that you burn times the gas cost. Um, right now, um, well, it's a few days ago when I, I last looked, the estimated gas cost was two gigawe. A we is an infinitesimally small amount of ether, 10 to the minus 14 ethers. Um, that is a pro was approximately then a very small amount of American cents. So, it, you know, one piece of gas is cheap. On the other hand, smart contracts can burn quite a lot of gas, especially if you put loops in them. That's something which you can get estimates from lots of simulators. Well worth doing if you've got computationally expensive looking solidity. Stuff that in Java you wouldn't think twice about just burning through it. Solidity, remember, you're paying by the instruction. It completely changes how you think about the efficiency of your code. Um, practical costs, if you're going to put it on mainnet, when I last looked, executing a contract is 21,000 gas. So that, that's the base entry cost without doing anything. That's just to run the execution to get the, the RPC accepted is 21,000. And then if you create the greeter contract, which is a very famous contract, which is the Hello World, it costs 279,000 gas. Now you can see why that very small number isn't quite so small after all. Because gas, that you burn a lot of gas. It's deliberately a very fine-grained figure. So actually, putting a two gigawe, which actually today I noticed wouldn't get you anywhere. The gas price today, right now today, is quite high. Um, then a two gigawe would cost you thirty cents just to put Hello World on the network, not to run it, just to put it on the network. You can quickly see that a bit of experimentation and a few a few mistakes with the gas price, the whole thing could get quite expensive quite quickly. I thoroughly recommend you spend most of your time on test nets until you're feeling very confident about the whole thing. Storage is also deliberately ridiculously expensive because it's put into the network, it's replicated everywhere, and it's kept forever. Therefore, it is expensive. It's 20,000 gas for 256 bits. Um, so 625,000 per megabytes. This means it's £1.25 to put a megabyte of storage onto the blockchain, which actually isn't that bad until you compare it with Amazon, which is like 10 cents a month for a gigabyte. So, and that's of, you know, Elasticsdoor, not S3. So um, um, the, the takeaway is not the detail. The takeaway is the fact that this co computational system is very clever, but it's orders of magnitude more expensive than any computing system you will have ever used before. And if you're on mainnet, that's significant. If you're on the test nets, doesn't really matter, you just sort of keep score. But as you watch it burning up that test gas, just bear in mind that's going to have to be paid for on, on mainnet, if, if you ever use mainnet. If you have a private network, clearly isn't a problem. I've mentioned the yellow paper a couple of times. This is a surprisingly well-written, uh, I was about to say a white paper, I guess it's a yellow paper. It's a surprisingly well-written well academic paper that explains what the Ethereum system is. It's also, incidentally, got a very insightful description of what the Bitcoin system is as its first major section, because they want to put Ethereum in context to explain why they bothered. And they explain Bitcoin in very rigorous, very simple, um, but also very clear terms. It's well worth um, extracting. Um, and it's on GitHub. There's always a PDF of the latest version there. It's, of course, being an academic paper, what's it written in? It's written in LaTeX, obviously. What else would you write a paper in? But uh, it's okay, you don't need to run LaTeX. He, he, he creates the PDF every time he changes it. So what does an application look like? Well, when you start looking at Ethereum and you start reading the descriptions, they talk about dApps, which is a bit confusing, but it just stands for distributed application, which doesn't help, does it? 
because it's such a generic term. DAP is a jargon word for a Ethereum blockchain application. So that is an application that is, uh, that is implemented using smart contracts on a blockchain, on an Ethereum blockchain. And what you tend to have is that the DAP is some client code, which is not blockchain code. That's JavaScript or Java, typically, or maybe .NET. Could be Python. There's a blockchain, which you can create your own blockchain. You can use one of the big test nets, whatever. There's one or more smart contracts. And something we're not going to talk too much about, you could have a distributed storage system. Swarm is a distributed storage system that works well with Ethereum. It's very like Ethereum in the sense that it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's append-only, it's cryptographically protected, it's highly distributed, it's highly resilient. The difference is it's actually designed to store large quantities of data, so it's, it's sort of optimised for that. Ethereum is optimised for compute and therefore doesn't want much data. The way you link them is when you put data into Swarm, it returns you the hash. And that hash is, is the key. That's the only way you get the data back out. But clearly that hash is a very handy number that can be shoved into a smart contract state. So if you need to link the two, to, again, it's relatively trivial to do. We're not going to talk more about Swarm, but if, you, if you're already thinking, this doesn't look very useful because I can't put any data in it, that's, what, that's the next step. Once you've got something working in Ethereum, go and look at Swarm, or it's got a relative called IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, who are trying to do much the same thing in much the same way. Actually, if, if they were in the room, they would start screaming at this point. They, don't get on, they, they actually don't get on very well. They have some philosophical differences, but I don't really care. They're very, very similar. So we'll, we'll fade Swarm out of the picture. So that's a DAP. That's what people talk about with a DAP. In reality, I won't tell you how long that took to do in PowerPoint. I just wish I'd been using Keynote. Um, so, in reality, a, a Java Ethereum application, that is a, use, a useful application, don't say that to Ethereum people, they get really annoyed, but you nearly always need something with the blockchain to do something useful. Then you're going to have a traditional Java application where, for example, you've got a web app at the front and you've got microservices running in some middle tier, and they're probably using a JDBC driver or a MongoDB driver to communicate with a tra traditional database for stuff that isn't highly distributed and verifiable and append only, just state, maybe user config, all that sort of thing. And then they're going to communicate with the blockchain. The way they're going to do that is to use a client library. It's directly analogous to using JDBC to access SQL Server. And it, V1 is called Web3J, and its author was here earlier. And unfortunately, he's had to go. I was hoping he'd be here. We could all turn and stare at him. But no, Connor is an absolute Ethereum expert. He has written all of Web3J, all 25,000 lines of code from the ground up. So if you have any questions about how Ethereum works, he really has had to figure it out. He's out because he, he, he's had to work out all the protocols natively. The great news is he's done it. We don't have to. Because having looked inside some of the libraries, it is really surprisingly <laughs> awkward to deal with an Ethereum blockchain. And this library makes it very straightforward just as JDBC makes SQL easy. The key decisions you need to make before you get too far into this are, what kind of blockchain do you want? Do you need to use the main net? Is it good enough to use one of the test nets? Much less assurance and security, but also free of charge. Are you going to set up your own public Ethereum network in your company, so it's firewalled off, but it but it's like a public network, any node can join it? Or are you actually going to set up a private, what's known as a permissioned blockchain, where you control who can access to it? And default standard Ethereum will not let you do that. You will need to use a blockchain that supports that. In the Ethereum world, you would use Quorum, which is an open source project originated at JP Morgan. And they specifically wanted to be able to do permissioned blockchains in the Ethereum world. And it's a fork of core Ethereum. I mean, they cooperate a lot sort of cross-porting, but it is a four. So that's, that's really a key thing because there's a lot implied in terms of cost and speed and you know, deployment and control over what kind of blockchain you want. Then how are you going to develop the smart contracts? I will show you a development environment in a minute, but um, very, it's a bit like choosing Maven or Gradle. Is everyone here a Java developer? Before I continue using Java analogies. Yeah. So, you know, if you choose Maven... And then half the team said, oh, good news, we've chosen Gradle. The world's a bad place. It's like that. If half the team went truffle, 
The other half went, oh, I don't know, I think we'll try Embark. Bad place. You really need to make some decisions about that. And then you need to decide what data do we have, what's on the blockchain, and what's in conventional data storage. And in fact, what's in Swarm, if you're advanced and going to use that. My hint is, as little on the blockchain as possible, because it's expensive and awkward and a difficult environment. But if it needs to be there, it needs to be there, because it's the magical bit, the append-only, highly distributed, etc. And then it's the, exactly the same question around the compute. What does the blockchain going to compute for us, and what are we going to compute out in normal application land? Again, a bit of a hint. The less you can do in your smart contracts, the better. For example, string handling in Solidity is extremely painful. There's all kinds of things you cannot do with strings because they're basically byte arrays. And because they're arrays, Solidity's got loads of restrictions on what you can do with what it calls a complex structured type. Guess what an array is? Complex structured type. So, for example, if you've got loads of string handling, I'll do that out in the Java world where it's brilliant, and then somehow use numbers to represent the strings in the smart contracts. That's just one example. There's quite a lot of that once you get into Solidity a bit. You go, this is harder than I thought. Then how do smart contracts interact with the outside world? Look at that in a minute. And what are you going to do about identities? So you're going to have to manage the identities of the people who are in interacting with the blockchain. Um, communicating with the world, very briefly, there's a pattern called an oracle. And it's what I described earlier. It's a piece of software that runs outside the blockchain. It listens for events being written out of smart contracts. It treats those as commands. It's, I guess, like a command pattern. Effectively, the event is a command. It then goes off and does stuff. Calls external data sources, causes compute to happen, puts stuff in databases, whatever you want. And then it calls the smart contract back with a result or something. So the smart contract knows that what it asked for has now been completed. So that's called an oracle. And it's the typical pattern for how you link a smart contract with the rest of the world. And it's one of the things Ethereum can do that some of the blockchains can't because of the events. I'm actually sort of going to skip over identity and leave you to read the slide because this is taking longer than I thought, unsurprisingly. I'll now confess it's the first time I've done this talk. So um, th there's quite a lot in it. But just to say that you know the way that in an enterprise Java app, you've got the problem that you've got users in the sort of normal authentication world, and you've got database users, and you've got the user for the middleware, and you know how you have to kind of figure out who's going to impersonate who, and are you going to pass credentials, and who can see whose private credentials, that stuff? Exactly the same problem. And it would be fair to say in the Ethereum world, not quite so far advanced in terms of finding standard solutions. The Auth0 people, you know, who do the, authentic the authorization server, they're currently actually working on a project to do a bit more of this for Ethereum. But it's something, I warn you, for an en enterprise application, it needs to be thought out quite early. You will find lots of blogs. Medium.com is your friend. But you need to figure out what you're going to do for your app. So for development, then, um, there's quite a lot of stuff out there, which is good news. And a lot of this didn't exist 18 months ago, so that's good news, too. It means it's fresh and modern, and um, most of it works quite well. Um, how it actually works is that you start off with your Java world and your Solidity world. And my general advice is that you might use one IDE for the two. So I personally use IntelliJ for my Java. In the last year or so, maybe even six months, there's now a very good Solidity plugin for IntelliJ. There's also one for Visual Studio, and there's one for Atom, and um, um, Sublime's got a whole load of plugins around this ecosystem. So although it's all in one IDE, I've actually sort of got two source routes. I'll actually show it to you practically in a couple of minutes. So I've got a Solidity source route, and it's got Solidity and its unit tests. And there's Java. And that, you, you know all about the Java, standard stuff, Java, JUnit, you know, Cucumber, whatever you've got. The way it all links together is that there is a framework in much the same way as we use, think of Gradle as a framework for building and testing Java. There is a framework that does that and a bit more for Solidity called Truffle. There are some others too. The other things over here, Truffle, Embark, Dapp Hub, Populous, and in fact, Web3J can do some of this too. It's all choices. I choose not to use Web3J for this bit, but you know, I'm sure if Connor was here, he'd point out it absolutely can do it. 
It's just that truffle is something of an embarkus sort of standards in the community. A lot of people use them. Um, so you have your Solidity source. You can write your unit tests in JavaScript or Solidity. I have never had any joy writing them in Solidity. It always seems to be far too hard, whereas I can write mocker tests in JavaScript reasonably easily, and they work very well. Um, and so that's one source tree. And Truffle gives me a command line where I say sane things like Truffle test, Truffle migrate between environments, Truffle compile, all that kind of thing. Um, I was actually doing that on the command line is quite hard. There's a lot of bits of tooling all have to be put together, and Truffles bundle that up for me. And that generates binaries and things called ABIs, something something interface files. They're JSON blocks which describe the interface to your contract. So a contract is described by the binary, which is pure, you know, binary as a hint in the name, and then a metadata block so that, so that tools know how to call it, because that information is not embedded in the binary. So if you like, in the Java world, you can't do reflection on the binary. You've got to have metadata alongside it. A bit like, you know, C++, you need the symbols, otherwise you don't know what's in it. Um, you then use, uh, what I then do, there's a couple of options at this point, but my recommendation is you use Web3j to read the binary and ABI files and produce stubs. Now, I know stubs are not perfect and that stubs come with their own challenges, but compared to calling the contract natively through the Web3j interface and handling all the possible things that can go wrong, the stubs work really nicely. Uh, and Connor's done a great job at creating very robust stubs that are real idiomatic Java. They use Java types, not Solidity types. They're quite easy to use once generated. And all that goes into your build, obviously, and you get jar files, which you deploy as normal. What you need to do with your smart contracts is uh, Truffle, again, builds this for you, which is great. You need to get those binary files deployed onto a blockchain. And it has to be a blockchain that the um, Java knows about. It's just a config parameter. It sort of goes without saying. But just as if your Java is going to call a web server, it's going to need the URL. If it's going to connect to a blockchain, it needs to know the network ID, the port number, and the IP address where it's going to make the initial connection to. Okay, so that, that's kind of how the dev environment works. And there are quite a few options for the blockchain bits of this. There's complete emulators. The Ganache, uh, I don't show on here, but Ganache is what I use. It's a whole blockchain node, but for, for local use only. I think it's written in JavaScript. Pretty certain it's written in JavaScript. It's got a command line version and a very attractive UI, and it just sits there pretending to be an Ethereum network. But it's just a local node. And there's Embark's got one built in as well, which I don't know much about, but apparently does the same thing. You can also have lightweight nodes. In the Ethereum ecosystem, there is a virtual machine written in JavaScript, believe it or not, um, and there is one written in Python. So you can actually roll your own frameworks using those. I've never tried it, but there's lots of reports of people doing that, and you know, with enough work, that all works fine. You can then create a local single node blockchain. I've got one running on my Mac right now, which I will show you. Um, oh, I'm nearly out of time. But, um, and you can also use hosted blockchains. Infura are a specialist, that's all they do. You can also build them on, on Azure very easily. And then there's the, the networks we've talked about. So the way that this works is that you build your source, you test it locally using something like Ganache, so complete virtualization of, of the blockchain. You then push it somewhere for testing. So that might be a local Geth node or something in your company where you've just got a couple of Geth nodes running that you create dynamically out of your build pipeline. And then you push it somewhere you really want to run it, which might be your, your production private network. It might be mainnet or wherever. So to very quickly show you something to prove this isn't all completely smoke and mirrors, and then we'll just go straight to a summary. Um, this is IntelliJ. I have no idea why that's come up. Um, what we've got here is, what do I show you quickly? Um, we've got a very simple Solidity contract called Voting Service. It allows people to make proposals and then to vote on them. And the person who owns them um, controls the proposals that there are. Um, alongside that, and so can you see here that there's a directory there I'm expanding called Solidity? That's, a, that's my entire build route for Solidity. If I go into my the correct... Um, oops, that was something I was doing earlier. If I go into the correct window here, which is always a challenge, not that one either.
then I've got this truffle system here that allows me to work in, and there was nothing to do, work in that environment, and it will, for example, run the unit tests for me. And so you've got a command line environment. Conceptually, it's very like using Gradle. And obviously, that's automatable. You can put it in builds, and you tend to get a lot of exceptions. I don't know what I've done there. And I'm not going to stop using contract config restored. So this is just the kind of thing that happens quite a lot with Ethereum development. For some reason, it doesn't like the contract code. When it says check your gas amount, it's almost certainly a problem with the contract code. Almost certainly what I need to do there is clean it and rebuild it, but I'm actually not sure. So I'm sort of out of time, so I'm not going to stop. But just the thing to show, show to you is that I've got over here, I've got a microservice, and it really is micro, the voting service, uh, the voting service which is written using standard Spring Boot. But because of Connor's um, excellent work on all this, you see, I can auto wire in my Web3J library. And once I've got that, I have generated stubs earlier from the voting service. You needn't understand how they work, but that's just generated Java. I didn't do anything. I just ran a command to do that. Once I've got that, it's all really quite nice because I can just um, extract a voting service from the blockchain. Again, this is all calling the stub. I'm not having to do anything clever at all. Um, and you know, I can check that it all worked. And then once I've got it, I can, having retrieved it, I can call methods on it. You see, it says add proposal there. I can call methods on it that correspond to the equivalent solidity methods in my solidity without having to understand all the governs underneath about RPCs and solidity types and all that stuff. It just sort of does it for me. And then we've got, um, I haven't got enough time to really demo it convincingly, but you'll have to take my word for it. That's calling the microservice. And I've got a geth node running locally. So that's just as valid a blockchain as anybody else's really. It's just, it's a very small blockchain. Um, and there's, um, no, it, it doesn't show RPCs. We, we'd have to change the state. Uh, let me see if I can change the state very, very quickly. Um, that's an index. See, I'm calling a microservice RPC, which has caused a TX a transaction to appear in the GEF API. Uh, sorry, console. And what's happening now is that it's immediately mined a block for me. Obviously, it's a single node. Ethereum, so it happens quite quickly, which is kind of nice. And then that will eventually... Now, you see the latency. This from microservice is not actually great behavior, as you can imagine. I mean, uh, Connor's got a, in his FAQs, is, here's how to increase the HTTP timeout. Um, there you go. So we have cast a vote for user one, and we've found that we've, there have been two votes cast. So that is, a, I realize, almost unhelpfully quick um, description of or demonstration of it, is that you've got your solidity world, that's the key takeaway, and there are things that you should, um, th th there's sort of conventions and frameworks to use in that world, but the good news is that today's frameworks make it quite like working with something like Java. It's similar, it's all even maybe Java was five years ago, it's reasonably mature. And then your normal Java world, if you use Web3J, actually it pretty well just makes it look like a network service. Yes, you do need to understand a few things about sending versus transactions and calls and events, but actually it's pretty straightforward. You can certainly abstract a lot of the complexity away from you. So to summarize, blockchain, distributed peer-to-peer, -peer, rather cranky database with some really quite amazing qualities around scale and trustworthiness. Um, Ethereum dApps, as they call them, which is smart contract applications, typically need to be used with something else. And today, as if, you know, right now, today in 2018, it's perfectly practical to integrate them in to Java applications, enterprise Java applications. The Solidity development environment is still maturing, but right now, today, although, as you saw, I was caught out by something. I'm sure that would have been a five-minute debug exercise to go, why on earth is it now thinks it's out of gas? But, you know, it wouldn't have taken very long. But there are, there's plenty of gotchas, but the tooling's getting better all the time. Six months ago, Ganache was this gnarly node module, and now it's this very attractive user interface, which you know allows you to explore the blockchain, and you can see exactly what's going on. So it's all progressing on quite quickly.
But the key thing is, is that it's important to understand some of the detail, but there are some quite big questions about how you're going to partition the application, how you're going to build it, how you're going to test it, that you actually, how you'll manage identity, for example, you really do need to get those nailed quite early. Um, repeatedly, as we see new developers in Dava have a go, they get very interested in all of the details around the tools, and then they paint themselves into a bit of a corner because they realize, actually, I've, this, these contracts are far too complicated. They're very expensive to run, and it's just far too difficult to do in Solidity. I should have partitioned the application differently. And it's just it's a little bit of experience needed, but it's certainly the awareness that that's quite a big decision as to how to partition the two, what goes where. But it is possible to build applications we have never built before. It is worth persisting with. Because I genuinely, I wouldn't be investing my personal time in this otherwise. I, I have not exactly drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm still a bit of a cynic. But I really do believe this allows us to do things we haven't done before. So therefore, it's interesting. And I think people are now starting to identify applications that maybe will have quite a big impact using it. So I think we're out of time. But thank you very much for your patience. I hope that was interesting. I'm done. There are lots of links. And you will get the slides as, from the conference website. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.